Speaker, I'm Julia Marvin, the chair of the class, and we, together with the Department of English and Chair of our Canopers, are sponsoring today's conference, um, which has also been a bittersweet occasion for all of us, of course, uh, because it marks the, the end of Speak Valley's decades of service to the University of Notre Dame. Together as his students, current and former colleagues, friends, family, a, a group among which there is considerable uh, overlap and dynamism, I must say, um, to talk Milton and philosophy and honor Steve's many, many contributions as a teacher, scholar, administrator, colleague, and again, friend. I think it's entirely typical of uh, Steve's uh, generosity and sense of service and appetite for learning that for uh, his retirement, rather than accept gifts from others, he has uh, created and offered the gift of this day to, to us, uh, putting together this program and even offering, of course, at the end, a lecture of his own as well as to all of you for coming out. Uh, to Lynn McCormick and Marie Rayback, the administrators for, for PLS and English, who have done so much to make the day come together. Also for all the people who will be contributing food, drink, and help to us over the course of the day. Uh, on a practical note, the um, women's, am I right, the women's bathroom is? No. Men's bathroom <laughs> that way, women's bathroom this way. Lunch will be served here. The reception at the end of the day will be served here. So I think now you have all the practical knowledge that you need to know to get started. And I'm going to be quiet so that we can stay on time. So thank you very much. chapter, The People of Asia and With the Jews, Asia, Israel, and England in Milton's Writings, which appears in Milton and the Jews, edited by, edited by Douglas Brooks, won the Milton Society of America's James Holly Hanford Award for Best Essay. She also served as a past president of the Milton Society of America. Trubowitz shares an interest in Milton and Isaac Newton with today's honoree, Professor Fallon. Uh, her essay, Reading Milton and Newton in the Radical Reformation, Poetry, Mathematics, and Religion, which was published in ELH, reflects the many stimulating conversations she's had with Steve on this topic. 
Rachel is currently completing a book tentatively entitled Milton and Mathematics. Her talk today is taken from that work in progress. Steve and Rachel have met countless times at various gatherings of Miltonists, and they have shared not only interests in Milton and Newton, but also a warm friendship. Rachel, I'm going to be Mike. I never speak loud enough. <laughs> okay. So, I have a very, very short PowerPoint. But this is the title. It was, it's, I have a habit of, of using very long titles, so I thought it would be better just to have you read it because it will take up almost all of my time to read the title. <laughs> Among John Locke's personal manuscripts at the University of Oxford's Bodleian Library is a curious document. It is a chart with seven columns of five to six vertical registers apiece. Locke's note on the reverse gives the year as 1691. However, the writing on the chart is not in Locke's hand. Instead, it belongs to Isaac Newton. Surprisingly, at least for some people, not for me and Steve, but um, <laughs> the chart does not pertain to mathematics or physics. Instead, although there are proportions and numbers, rather the chart illuminates the apocalypse, the New Testament's prophetic grand finale. For those who subscribe to the Enlightenment conception of Newton as chiefly a scientist, one of the greatest and most rational of all time, this chart may seem to be an anomaly, and hence easy to dismiss as decidedly not Newtonian in any sense that matters. Several decades of scholarship, however, have undone the Enlightenment interpretation of Newton. Historians of science now uniformly agree that instead of two entirely separate Newtons, the serious mathematical physicist and the eccentric, if not completely insane, <laughs> analyst of biblical prophecy, there is only one Newton whose mathematical physics and biblical hermeneutics substantively interanimate one another. Okay, that's, just keep looking at the picture. I'll tell you when the, the next slide is not coming up for. I've started with the revaluation of the two Newton premise in Newton scholarship because I believe that it can serve as a productive model for how we might reevaluate John Milton. It is a critical commonplace that Milton was deeply immersed in biblical prophecy and that he thought of himself as a latter-day ancient Hebrew or New Testament prophet such as Isaiah or John of Patmos. However, that he was also an advent adherent to what after Ursula Goldberg I call the new geometrical method has for the most part yet to be acknowledged. My claim is that not unlike the two Newtons, the well-known prophetical Milton and the still largely unrecognized geometrical Milton are one and the same. My point of departure for this argument is the quotation that I include in my title, Exquisite Reasons and Theorems Almost Mathematically Demonstrative. This phrase is embedded in the often quoted passage from Areopagitica in which Milton celebrates John Selden as, quote, the chief of learned men reputed in this land, and extols Selden's de jure naturali et gentium juxa disclin, dis, somebody help me with Latin, um, <laughs> abriorum, or I'll just call it de jure. Okay. <laughs> uh, so this, and this is what he says about uh, Selden. This is Selden's volume. This volume of nat natural and national laws proves not only by great authorities brought together, but by exquisite reasons and theorems.
is almost mathematically demonstrative that all opinions, yea, errors, known, read, and collated, are of main service and assistance toward the speedy attainment of what is truest. Milton's praise for Selden is sincere, but it is also strategic. It provides the poet with protective cover for one of his most powerful arguments against Parliament's licensing order of 1643. Milton provocatively praises the benefit which may be had of books promiscuously read. Promiscuous reading, he maintains, is crucial to the advancement of learning and the moral health of the English people. The poet calls upon Selden as a witness for this extraordinary argument. In day three, the erudite MP, quote, one of your own now sitting in parliament, proves that reading widely and without external constraints is of main service and assistance toward, the, as I said, the speedy attainment of what is true, truest. Men should be free to read whatever books they choose, since even bad books, to a discreet and judicious reader, serve in many respects to discover to confuse, to foreign foreign, and to illustrate. Milton praises Selden's assertion that all opinions they are known and collated are of main service and assistance toward the speedy attainment of what is true. He also um, celebrates Selden's two methods for justifying this claim. These methods are one, bringing great authorities together, and two, deploying exquisite reasons and theorems almost mathematically demonstrative. Shoring of a truth claim by citing great authorities would be standard procedure for a humanist like Milton. By contrast, deploying exquisite reasons and theorems almost mathematically demonstrative would not. Milton's accolades for um, unexpected accolades for Selden's almost mathematically demonstrative method would seem to beg for a scholarly analysis. In fact, however, such a claim has gone, I would say, pretty much entirely unnoticed. Why do Miltonists generally include the poet's undeniable admiration for mathematical demonstrations, Aria Pachitica, while they simultaneously praise, uh, the, the uh, highlight the poet's praise in the very same sentence for unrestrained reading and learning? One possible reason is that Milton's close conjoining of these two practices doesn't appear to make any sense. Um, what could be more restrained and less promiscuous than theorems almost mathematically demonstrative? Why does Milton applaud the wanton pursuit of all opinions they era and in the very same breath extol the necessary and inevitable truths that mathematical demonstrations deliver? Is Milton for many, the answer seems to be yes. By completely excising or ignoring praise, Milton's praise for exquisite reasons and theorems, they treat the poet's endorsement of mathematical de demonstration as an inconvenient slip. Admittedly, this response makes sense, given the aforementioned contradiction. I propose, nonetheless, that we take a different approach, one that is equally justifiable and, I believe, more productive. Rather than brush Milton's mathematical references aside as an unfortunate miscalculation, I show instead that they represent an important but as yet unacknowledged key to understanding the full scope of the poet's ambitions in this tract. In my longer chapter version of this paper, I delineate five new insights that we can gain when we take Milton's reference to mathematics and the geometrically geometrical methods, seriously. Mercifully, today I shall focus only on two. Uh, my first insight is that Milton's acclaim for Selden's exquisite reasons and theorems correlates with the poet's admiration for Galileo, whom in concert with Selden, he praises in Aria Most scholars have yet to pay attention to Milton's implicit affiliation of Selden with Galileo. I maintain, by contrast, that this affiliation is crucial to understanding Milton's unexpected praise for Selden's application of the geometrical method outside of geometry, that is, to natural law. In Areopagitica, Milton describes his visit with the great scientist in 1638. 
No doubt prior to that visit, he had read Galileo's dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, which was published in 1632. As I shall demonstrate in a later section of this presentation, Milton's praise for Selden's exquisite readings and theorems resonates suggestively with Galileo's first person assertion in two chief world systems, that mathematical truths are the same as those recognized by divine wisdom. And this is what Galileo says. I say that as to the truth of the knowledge which is given by mathematical proofs, this is the same that divine wisdom recognizes. No wonder the Roman Catholic inquisitors deemed Galileo a heretic. As the almost in the almost mathematical dem demonstrative proofs implies, Milton indicates that Selden's ex exquisite reasons and theorems are similar but not identical to Euclid's or to Galileo's. For Selden, humankind needs the assistance of God, or what Selden terms after Aristotle, the intellectual agents or active intellect to understand natural law. Tellingly, except for this quiet almost, Milton does not allude to Selden's uh, concept of the active intellect in Arithmetica. Instead, he focuses squarely on Selden's geometrical approach to validating the principles of natural law. I contend that Milton almost obliquely alludes not only to Selden's intellectual agents, but also to Galileo's view of mathematical certainty. For, as just noted, uh, Galileo believes that the certainty of mathematical truths is the same that divine wisdom recognizes. Somewhat differently from Galileo, Milton identifies the perfection of divine wisdom and mathematical knowledge as proportionally related to one another. They are not identical, but instead almost the same. This almost sameness finds expression in the area of Judica in Milton's assertion that the golden rule in theology and arithmetic cohere with one another. And this is what he writes, to be ser still searching what we know not by what we know, still closing up truth to truth as we find it, for all her body is homogeneal and proportional. This is the golden rule in theology as well as in arithmetic and makes up the best harmony in a church not the forced and outward union of cold and neutral and inwardly divided minds. The best harmony in a church derives from the golden rule in theology as well as in arithmetic, both of which sanction proportionality. In law and ethics, the principle of proportionality, which finds its origin in Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, is central to 17th century conversations about toleration and human rights concerns that Milton undeniably addresses in Mary of Judica and again in the tender kings and magistrates. Tellingly, in the tenure, Milton reiterates his reference to golden rule principles and his emphasis on the coherence between the, the principle of proportionality in arithmetic and in justice and morality. In the tenure, however, he puts enhanced, enhanced pressure on proportionality, on the proportionality principles infallible results, both in law and ethics, and in arithmetic and geometry, and as he writes, for this golden rule of justice and morality, as well as of arithmetic, out of three terms which they admit, will as certainly and unavoidably bring out the fourth as any problem that ever Euclid or Apollonius made good by demonstration. The golden rule of justice and morality, as well as of arithmetic, certainly and unavoidably bring out solutions that are as unassailable as any problem that ever Euclid or Apollonius made good by demonstration. While in Arabogitica, um, the golden rule in theology, as well as in arithmetic, makes up the best harmony in a church, in the tenure, these rules infallibly demonstrate that tyranny is a Catholic crime. Milton's almost Galilean view of the identity between divine wisdom and mathematical knowledge leads to my second new insight into Area of Judica, which is that Milton's praise for the geometrical method in his passage on 
Selden in Ariovagitica correlates with his much discussed condition that he was marked for special service as God's prophetic spokesman to the nation. That Milton believed he was called to be a prophet of the Lord is indisputable. But how can one speak as an inspired prophet like Daniel or John of Paphos and with a demonstrative clarity and certainty of a Euclid or Apollonius all at the same time? At first glance, this would seem to be impossible, but not for Milton. <laughs> uh, however, as Raphael, with his higher angelic intellect, teaches Adam and Eve in Paradise Lost, prophetic or intuitive insight, insights are proportionately equivalent to mathematical or discursive understandings. Reason, as a sociable angel explains, manifests itself differently in angelic and human bodies. Reason is the soul's being, discourse or intuitive discourse, it, or, in, or intuitive discourse is often this yours, the latter most is ours. The two forms of reason, however, differ but in degree of kind the same. Both lead to, although never fully reach, truth, even if discursive reasoning is slow and sometimes laborious, while intuition is instantaneous and effortless. Anticipating paradise lost, Milton's praise for mathematical demonstration in Ariopagitically, surprisingly, except for me and Steve, uh, coheres with his sublime flights of prophetic for now the time seems come wherein Moses the great prophet may sit in heaven rejoicing to see that memorable and glorious wish of his fulfilled, when not only our 70 elders, but all the Lord's people become prophets. Put another way, mathematical demonstration and divine inspiration in Ariopagitica differ in degree, but are in kind the same. In Ariopagitica, the prophetic Milton frequently hurls the apocalypse by proclaiming with certainty that England, the new Israel, has been chosen above all other nations to perfect the Reformation, even to the reforming of Reformation itself. Milton's recurrent, sometimes violent, but also evocative references to the millennium are much more than rhetorical flourishes. As Juliet Cummins uh, maintains John Milton's intellectual and imaginative engagement with eschatological ideas is evident in his work from the beginning to the very close of his career. What has yet to be acknowledged, however, is that for Milton, both geometry and apocalyptic prophecy similarly elevate our intellects from the ordinary to the extraordinary, thus helping us, as he puts it in, of education to repair the ruins of our first parent. One reason why Milton correlates the geometric method with intuition and prophetic insight is that all three ways of knowing equally devalue sense perception and empirical investigation. As Goldenbaum observes, Galileo's mathematizing of nature proved threatening to contemporary Roman Catholic theologians. And um, who's right over there? as well as to some Protestant philosophers, such as Henry Moore and John Locke, because it promised access to the inner structure of nature uh, and not simply to the superficial outsides of things. Descartes was to extend Galileo's mathematizing of nature through his inventions of analytical geometry. As Golden Baum again observes, according to the analytical geometry of Descartes, the figure of a circle parallels its equation if considered within the framework of the Cartesian coordinates with a defined unit. There, the figure of the circle is substantially identified with its equation without any visible similarity to the figure with its equation. It doesn't look like a circle. Uh, it looks like the equation. The new mathematics, the emphasis on the physical observation of nature, even or especially when enhanced by telescopes, microscopes, and other instruments for magnifying what the naked eye can see, meshes with the iconoclasm central to both radical Protestantism and the Protestant poetic, to borrow Barbara Blowski's term, uh, uh, that, that is frequently associated with Milton's work. Not unlike the mathematization of nature, which centers on the unseen inter, inner substance rather than the visible outside appearance of things, Milton's Protestantism emphasizes
signifies as the inner light and things invisible to mortal sight. Given that mathematics, which not unlike inward illumination, offers a way to see that is independent of physical vision, it is not difficult to understand why mathematics in general and the geometrical method more specifically would have had a special appeal to Milton, whose eyesight steadily declined during the 1640s when he published Pacifica. In 1652, Milton became completely blind. I argue that because Milton recognizes these striking and surprising cross currents between mathematics and inward illuminations, he moves seamlessly between his praise for Selden's exquisite points and theories, theorems and his inspired passages of sublime prophetic prose in Area Pachitica. In making this claim, I move in a completely different direction from Gordon Teske, who in homage to Arthur Rimbaud, focuses on the delirium that allows Milton to discover the highest truth. Teske argues that creating art is, quote, an experience of prophetic frenzy in which one is continually departing from a standard that is nevertheless felt to be, he would say, oppressively present. Milton called that standard reason. For Teske, although Milton is continually departing from reason, at the same time he feels burned by the pres presence of the standard to which he feels compelled to comply. By contrast, I contend that although not identical, Milton's and Galileo's views of the relationship between the indisputable truths that mathematics and divine wisdom uh, bear, I, I say that they bear his hitherto unacknowledged but important family resemblance to one another, that they're not utterly unlike that they are, have a kin, kinship relation. Uh, uh, OK, Galileo's view that mathematical truths are the same as, as the truths that divine wisdom recognizes bears, as I mentioned earlier, but I'm going to take it up a little bit again, uh, bears fruitful comparison with Milton's aforementioned conjunction in Areopagitica between the golden rule of arithmetic, or the rule of three, and the golden rule of theology. In Matthew 7, 12, the golden rule in theology is stated as follows. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. This proposition forms the centerpiece of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. To understand why Milton evokes the golden rule in arithmetic, however, we need to revisit the famous passage from Areopagitica, where Milton told the tragic but ultimately redemptive story of Truth, the Virgin, who once came into the world in a perfect shape, glorious to look upon. Truth remained in the world throughout the ministry of Jesus. Then, after he ascended, a wicked race of deceivers hewed her lovely form into a thousand pieces and scattered them to the four winds. Ever since, Truth's sad friends have gone up and down, gathering up limb after limb as they have found them. They have not yet found all the pieces, and they won't find all of them until the second coming of Jesus, who will bring them all together and, quote, mold them into an immortal feature of loveliness and perfection. In the meantime, Milton insists, our task is to continue seeking. We must not allow anyone to forbid and disturb the search for truth. We must not follow those who think it, as he says, think it a calamity that any man dissents from their maxims. Such forbidders neither help unite those dissembled pieces, nor do they permit others to, you know, to do that. Milton makes it clear that in order uh, for our search to succeed, we must first acknowledge the fundamental proposition that, quote, the true body of truth is fundamentally, homogeneally, homogeneal and, and proportional. If we do so recognize this fundamental uh, irrefutable principle, uh, we will see as that as we continue to find them, the dispersed pieces of truth body will start to close up one, uh, among, one to the other. The golden rule of arithmetic is also called rule three. And you probably did that in seventh grade in, in, uh, in, in algebra, uh, is, um, is key to our efforts to reassemble truth's homogeneal and proportional body because this rule allows you to solve problems based on proportion. By having three numbers, A, B, C, and this is the formula version, such that A is to B equals C is to the unknown, um, you can find the unknown number 
But okay, this is probably what you got in seventh grade. Let's say you have six pints of paint for two bedrooms. How many pints of paint would you need for four bedrooms? So it, it's it, so that's the rule of three that you got in seventh grade. But remember those awful word problems. Yeah. Um, maybe you got. Okay, but it's the same principle. Uh, more broadly considered, by following the golden rule in arithmetic, we will recognize that our search for new truths is not random or haphazard, even though it sometimes seems to be that way because you know we're picking up pieces here and there, and, and there seems to be no method to this madness. But there is a method. Um, this is because the rule of three allows us to use the truths we already know to determine the truths that we do not know as yet. So. You might ask, how does the golden rule of theology compare with all these calculations? The golden rule of theology goes hand in hand with the golden rule of arithmetic because the injunction to do unto others exhorts us to practice the charity necessary to embrace the underlying proportionality that unifies the scattered pieces of truth's body. These pieces, superficially, might appear to be complete. By practicing charity, however, we can learn not only to identify but also to embrace their underlying kinship. Or put another way, we will understand how, this is only in relationship to truth with a capital T, dissimilitudes can be proven. Thus, although practicing charity and mathematically resolving problems in proportionality might appear to have nothing whatsoever to do with one another, in fact, the two rules are equally golden. We must follow both in order to find the scattered pieces of truth dismembered body and to start to close them up one to the other. The proximity among mathematics, theology, and prophecy in Mary Bajitica finds an important historical analog in the writings of such contemporaneous eschatologists as John Napier and Joseph Mead. Isaac Newton would later follow Napier and Mead's example. Both apply the geometrical method to the book of Revelation in order to crack the esoteric code of that mysterious text. It's true that Milton never attempts to methodize the book of Revelation as do Napier, Mead, and, and Newton, um, or to uh, compute the precise date, the date of the end of days. He, 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 I think I, Steve can help me. What, what did he say? 1660 was the end of the or, or two thousand. Can't push you back. <laughs> yeah, as one is one to do. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, uh, at any rate, nevertheless, by moving seamlessly between his praise for the geometrical method and his apocalyptic proclamations, the poet acknowledges close affinities between mathematics and prophecy similar to those that inform Napier, Meads, and Newton's analyses of the book of Revelation. While the role of eschatology in the development of new mathematical methods rarely is recognized today, in the 17th century, eschatology and mathematics could be difficult to distinguish. At first glance, prophetic vision and geometrical method and other mathematical rules and, and principles would appear to have nothing whatever to do with one another. Nonetheless, some of the Reformation's most important and prominent eschatologists, mathematics, such as Napier uh, uh, and Newton, believed that the geometrical method and other kinds of mathematical demonstrations provided optimal means for deciphering revelation. As just mentioned, uh, even though he did not calculate the price, precise year in which the world would end. However, like them, he places his mathematical observations in close proximity to his prophetic ones, a synonymity that scholars have overlooked. The poet has no trouble shifting back and forth between the geometrical methods, necessary conclusions, and his story and sublime prophetic prose. I believe that Napier's and Mead's mathematical approaches to interpreting the book of Revelations inspires the ease with which Milton moved between exquisite reasons and theorems and prophecy in Areopagitica. In placing his praise for the geometrical method side by side and in counterpoint with his apocalyptic proclamations, Milton stands in the same radical reformational line of millennial mathematical exegetes that stretches from Napier to Mead and to Newton. The affinities that Milton 
confined between geometry and prophecy lead us back to Milton's qualified Galilean belief that in acquiring geometry's necessary understandings through which the human mind, through which the human mind equals the divine in objective certainty, uh, uh, this objective certainty that for Galileo, geometry shares with, with divine wisdom, as well as the perfect non-sensorial vision that both geometry and prophetic and prophecy bestow upon our inner eye inform Milton's exhortation that we should behold London and the English nation in the same non-empirical ways that he does. Finally, time for slide change. <laughs> This is, I don't want to read out the whole passage. You can just read it and enjoy it while I'm talking. When seen with an objective certainty equal to that of the deity, toward which both ge geometry and uh, prophecy lead us, we clearly can behold London as a city of refuge and the mansion house of liberty. We also will see that England is a nation of prophets, of sages, and worthies, and recognize how increasingly public assent to the force of reason and convincement in the present moment precipitously speeds up the arrival of the approaching Reformation. Milton's elevated pr prophetic prospect in this behold passage inspires some of his most soaring prose. As David Warper insightfully observes, Milton's visionary rhetoric in Ariopagitica generates a sense of spiritual assent and uh, the experience of emotional uplift or the Republican Simon, as her book aptly terms it. In addition, in addition to inspiring spiritual and emotional transcendence, however, Milton's soaring prose confers the perfect certainty, which equals the divine, that we acquire, uh, that we achieve upon acquiring geometry's necessary understandings. In the following passage, reason and spirit reach new heights both at the same time. In keeping with Milton's monism, newly announced in Ariopagitica, as Christopher Kendrick demonstrates, and Steve. Ventriloquizing Jesus in John 4, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Milton tells us that if we find eyes to lift up, we now can see prophetically the future fruits of our present labors. The fields are white already. Tellingly, the poet follows up on his scriptural allusion to the Gospel of John and his prophetic vision of Reformation now by arguing from necessity as one would in a geometrical demonstration. Where there is much desire to learn, there of necessity will be much arguing, much writing, many opinions. Milton argues from necessity time and again elsewhere in Ariopagitica. In one known allusion, the poet uh, compares Apuleius's uh, tale of Psyche's incessant, incessant labor to cull out and sort of sund asunder those confused seeds to our seemingly impossible task of separating out the innumerable cunning resemblances between good and evil who, as two twins cleaving together, leapt forth into the world. Milton concludes that, therefore, the knowledge and survey of the vice in this world is so necessary to the constituting of her human virtue and the standing of error to the confirmation of truth. Elsewhere, after skewering Plato's Republic for its long list of censorious laws, including or especially the edict that no poet should so much be read to any private man, Milton concludes that to sequester out of the world into uh, Bacon's Atlantic or Thomas More's utopian polities which can never be drawn into us will not mend our condition because God hath placed us unavoidably in the midst of this world of evil. We, because of that, we necessarily must learn how best to ordain wisely in the here and now. Uh, similarly, he claims that Plato's licensing of books necessarily pulls along with it so many other kinds of licensing, which will make us all both ridiculous and weary. Um, uh, Milton further strengthens his unassailable assertion that, uh, that Plato's licensing of books, and I just read the quote, by reframing it as an if-then argument, one of the bulwarks of deductive logic. In this way, Milton, as it were, necessarily proves that this order avails nothing to the suppressing of scandalous, seditious, and libelous books, which are mainly intended to be suppressed. 
suppressed. Just as he shows that arguments of necessity align perfectly with prophetic discourse, so Milton defends liberty by first crafting a deductive cause and effect argument and then by associating liberty with a sublime vision of transcendence. He asks the Lords and Commons if they desire, quote, to know the immediate cause of all this free writing and free speaking. This effect, all this free writing and speaking, he writes, flattering the MPs, cannot be assigned a truer cause than your own mild and free and human government. It is the liberty, Lords and Commons, which your own valorous and happy councils have purchased us. Milton's rhetoric reflects Galileo's assertion that natural philosophy deals with the causes of effects. And these causes are not given to us by experience, or at least not through experience alone, but through mathematical analysis, the new geometrical method more specifically. Let me pause for a moment to expatiate a bit on what the term of the new geometrical method means and why it is described as new. Surprisingly, the very term the geometrical method is new. The term first gained currency in 16th century Europe when mathematics was on an upswing due to the new science of mechanics. Today, when we think of the geometrical method, we usually associate it with what we see when we open Euclid's elements. Instead of a coherent flow of text, the lines are broken up into different state, types of statements, definitions, axioms, postulates, propositions, and demonstrations. Uh, borrowing from Aristotle, early modern practitioners attributed two aspects to the geometrical method, synthesis and analysis. Synthesis describes the derivation of conclusions from principles. Most of us think of synthesis when we refer to the geometrical method. Uh, as in Euclid's elements, the synthetic aspect of the geometrical method starts with a given set of axioms and postulates. For Hobbes and other early uh, modern proponents of the geometrical method. However, the analytic aspect was more important than the synthetic one. Indeed, and this is my last and final slide. Indeed, as, um, as Goldenbaum notes, with the exception of Spinoza, uh, early modern rationalists hardly ever used the explicit synthetic form of the geometrical method. Analysis starts with ends, and it works back to beginnings or principles and axioms. Spinoza is the exception. He's listed all his, his principles and axioms up front. But this, was an, an, this is what we think of when we think of the geometrical method. But all these other rationalists were not we're just like, they using the synthetic part, the listing all that. That was just, it was, that was just you know, extra, you know, it took up extra room. Um, in Arian Pagetica is precisely the specific kind of new geometrical analysis that designates liberty as the immediate cause of new notions and ideas, the thinking of which sublimely sends our minds and spirits aloft like the influence of heaven. Briefly stated, which I haven't been brief at all, but briefly stated, the new geometrical analysis of liberty's causes and effects, or more precisely, its effects and causes, because we look backwards, leads inevitably to sublime story. Uh, put another way, in Areopagitica, Milton demonstrates that poetic and political sublimity coheres with, but is not identical to, Galileo's argument that the geometrical method allows human reason to ascend to the level of divine wisdom. For these reasons, the poet effortlessly shifts back and forth between necessary arguments and prophetic vision. Milton also seamlessly moves from effect and cause geometrical analysis to the poetic and the Republican sublime. To conclude, the main takeaway of this talk is that for Milton, divine inspiration, the new geometrical method, and promiscuous reading complement rather than contradict one another as the best means to acquire truth. In Arapagitica and elsewhere in the poet's uh, writings, the, the borders among exquisite reading, reasons, mathematical demonstrations, reason is but choosing free will, and right reason, inward illumination, and an intuitive apprehension of external reality are extremely porous. For Milton, the truths derived from mathematical proofs are proportionally related to the truth that re reason freely chooses. Both are the same, are almost the same as the truth that divine wisdom recognizes, to quote Galileo once more. 
injury. Instead of two Newtons, there is only one. The prophetical, geometrical Milton. Thank you very much. <laughs> Consciousness and Natality in Early Modern England, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2020, argues that the writings of poets like John Milton and Thomas Traherne played an important role in the emergence of consciousness as a concept. With Elizabeth B. Harvey at the University of Toronto, he has just completed John Donne's Physics, a book about Donne's devotions and the history of embodiment. All being well, this book will be published in 2024 to mark the 400th anniversary of the publication of the devotions. With Jane Nicholson of Yale, I hope I pronounced her name correctly, uh, Tim is currently writing a book on English and Indo-Persian lyric representations of mindedness. Entitled Horizons of the Mind, this book uses the poetry of Traherne and Bidel of Delhi, who were exact contemporaries, to study a previously unnoticed Afro-Eurasian thought world organized around the ideas of the medieval Islamic philosopher Ibn Sina, known in the Latin West as Avicenna. He is also beginning a book project on how Milton understands and represents the concept of life, which will be titled Life in Milton's Late Poems. He has articles published or forthcoming in PMLA, Representations, ELH, ELR, Milton Studies, and Modern Philology, a journal he began co-editing in 2022. Steve and Tim have struck up a friendship in recent years through commenting on each other's drafts and sharing ideas, uh, with Steve saying that he is getting the better of that party. <laughs> so, Tim, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Steve. Uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, thank you uh, so much, Steve, uh, for inviting me to this, and thank you all for showing up. It's a real honor uh, to be here. Um, so, I first knew I wanted to be a Miltonist when I read Steve Fallon's Milton Among the Philosophers in the first year of my PhD program. I found the book so lucid, so well argued, so suggestive, and like so fun. Um, and until reading that book, I didn't know that I was allowed to connect my love of 17th century philosophers, particularly Descartes, uh, with the poets I was planning to study in my doctorate. So Steve's Milton Among the Philosophers gave me permission, as it were, to proceed. Uh, and in a very real sense, my first book, uh, Coming To, would have been impossible uh, without Steve, um, who was also, I should add, kind of to write a really nice blurb uh, <laughs> uh, on the back of it. Um, um, and I've recently, uh, as um, Matt was saying, have had the pleasure of uh, being in a long uh, exchange of emails uh, with Steve about an article I've written about uh, his, his book manuscript on uh, Milton and Newton and about matter and life. And it's been like one of the highlights of my, my um, I don't know, intellectual year, let's say. It's been wonderful. Um, uh, what I'm about to present to you today is like really new work, uh, uh, really new work. Um, in fact, so new that I found myself, you know, the, the, the train uh, tracks between Chicago and, uh, and, um, and South Bend are like, you know, under construction. And so I found myself working on this paper on a bus, uh, <laughs> bumping, bumping around, going to Notre Dame, uh, being, you know, the height of foolishness. With my, you know, Aquinas is summa, you know, open. I was, I was like, oh, I need some Aquinas, and then realizing, oh my gosh, this is a fool's errand. So, you know, um, uh, uh, so take what follows uh, for what it is, which is brand new work, uh, and I hope to learn from all of you about how to make it more compelling. Um, all right. So the title of my talk is Milton's Avicenna. So in De Doctrina Christiana, uh, John Milton attacks the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. Quote. Most moderns, moderni, contend that everything emerged out of nothing, out of which nothing, I reckon, their own opinion originates. <laughs> Milton frames his sustained and detailed attack against the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo in relation to unnamed moderni or moderns. This claim presents the reader with at least two puzzles. First, 
Why does Milton claim that creation ex nihilo is a modern idea? And second, who are the modernity against whom Milton is arguing? I'll return to the first puzzle in a moment. Before I do so, however, please allow me to put my cart before my horse and present a quick and dirty answer to the second puzzle. In today's talk, I will argue that if we are to properly understand Milton's position against the creatio ex nihilo of the moderns, we need to see Milton as responding to the legacy of the medieval Islamic philosopher Ibn Sina, known in the Latin West as Avicenna. Before continuing, I should state the obvious. In the eyes of existing Milton scholarship, it is not at all obvious that Avicenna is one of the philosophers among whom Milton should be placed. Yet I would submit today that the title of my talk, Milton's Avicenna, indexes a historical relationship as real as that, say, captured by the phrases Milton's Plato or Milton's Aristotle. In my talk, I will argue that Milton engaged with Avicenna's legacy in an informed way, and that he could do so because, uh, contrary to perceived scholarly wisdom, Avicenna's works were, in fact, widely available and widely read in Milton's England. To argue for the existence of Milton's Avicenna is both to expand the canon of philosophers among whom Milton should be placed, and to widen typical assumptions about the horizon of philosophical inquiry in 17th century England. In my talk today, I hope to convince you that such a broadening of received wisdom about Milton's intellectual horizons is probable and perhaps even necessary. Okay, so allow me to return to my first puzzle. Why does Milton claim that creation ex nihilo is a modern idea? This puzzle is really, was really difficult for me to get a grip on, for as Kierhard May and many other scholars have demonstrated, the idea of creation ex nihilo is very far from modern. And this isn't something I need to tell people in this room, but I'm, for the sake of clarity, I'm gonna go through it. Although creation from nothing was later read as being implied in the book of Genesis, and although many early Christian thinkers held this principle to be an expression of divine freedom, it took almost two centuries for the idea to become fully articulable. In May's account, the first Christian thinkers to articulate a theory of creatio ex nihilo were Tatian, uh, Theophilus of Antioch, and Irenaeus, figures who lived between about 120 and 200 AD. Through debate with Gnostics and the inheritors of Greco-Roman philosophy, church fathers like Irenaeus made the conceptual breakthrough required for a robust theory of creation from nothing. Matter was not unoriginated or eternal. No, matter was created by God. As Irenaeus lays out in Against Heresies, God first creates matter from nothing, and then God creates the cosmos from that matter. The view developed with such clarity by Irenaeus became a sort of default position in early Christianity. Across a number of texts, Augustine articulates a similar view. Before God created the world, he, made, he first made what the Book of Wisdom calls formless matter, which Augustine glosses as a nihil aliquid, a nothing something, uh, which then becomes the matter for creation. Quote, you made this next to nothing out of nothing, Augustine writes in the Confessions, and from it, that is from formless matter, you made the great things at which the sons of men wondered. So creatio ex nihilo is then a position held by many thinkers that Milton would have classified as, quote, ancient Christians, to borrow a phrase from his commonplace book. Milton read these church fathers closely and with attention. We know this. He would have known that they articulated a version of creatio ex nihilo, and he would have classified them as antiqui, not as moderni. So Milton's designation of the view he is against as a view that has been articulated by the moderns means, I think, that he's not attacking iterations of the ex nihilo position held by such fathers as Irenaeus. But the history of this position is, of course, long <laughs> and complicated, including, today in just two moments, uh, the arguments against the eternity of the world uh, by John Philoponus uh, and the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215's establishment of the creation of the cosmos in time and from nothing. God made all things from the beginning of time and from nothing. At some point along the way, Irenaeus' um, fine or good or what is it, neutral uh, ex nihilo was, in Milton's view, transformed into the bad ex nihilo of the moderns, the moderni. So what, I want to ask, if anything, is the differentia separating the acceptable version of ex nihilo creation espoused by the antiqui from the unacceptable view espoused by the moderni whom Milton targets in De Doctrina. 
So to get a grip on what might be entailed by this differentia, I need to perform an analysis of Milton's argument in De Doctrina. Before I do this, however, please allow me to like sketch a really brief picture of the conceptual backdrop presupposed by Milton's discussion uh, of creation. And this is just purely for you know clarity for everyone. So Milton inherited an ancient conceptual architecture for understanding creation, the roots of which were Aristotelian. There were, Aristotelians argued, different kinds of kinesis or motus, Greek and Latin words, English both as motion and change. The most common changes are accidental, right? changes that affect a given substance. Qualitative changes called alteration, when a substance moves from hot to cold, health to sickness, changes in place, locomotion, and changes in quantity, that is augmentation or diminution. Rarer are substantial changes, when a given substance becomes something else. Corruption marks the end of one substance, say this human being right here, which will be replaced by another substance or substances, say the corpse that this human being will become after the moment of death. Here you go, they've literally been done for a long time, so that's, you know, the example is, you know, evidence of that. Uh, so generation, you know, conversely marks the beginning of a new substance, as when, say, an embryo comes into being. So substantial changes involve the end or beginning of a given substance. But those ends or beginnings involve relations with something else that exists either before or after. So put otherwise, there exists a substratum in which those changes occur. Either the substance itself, if the change is accidental, or prime matter, whatever that is, uh, if the change is substantial. Now in addition to these natural changes, another set of changes were added, supernatural changes. Supernatural change takes place in the absence of any substratum underpinning it. In the conceptual architecture inherited by Milton, supernatural change included creation, the bringing into existence of something out of nothing, and annihilation, the bringing of something that exists into nothing. It is not even clear that such events should be called changes, right? As many of you, I'm sure, know, this was subject to debate, with such thinkers as Aquinas rejecting the language of change in relation to creation. Instead of change, a motus, or mutatio, Aquinas thought of creation as an activity, uh, an operatio. So Milton accepts this broadly Aristotelian framework for natural change. But in De Doctrina, he rejects supernatural change, or whatever we want to call it, in quite vehement terms. Milton attacks the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. Most moderns contend that everything emerged out of nothing, out of which nothing, I reckon, their own opinion originates. He provides philological corroboration for this view. It is certain that neither the Hebrew word bara, nor the Greek word kitsin, nor the Latin priare means to make out of nothing. On the contrary, each of them regularly means to make something out of matter, materia. In the languages used by the ancient Hebrews, Greeks, and Romans, the words we would translate as creation did not, Milton claims, mean bringing something into existence out of nothing. Running through scriptural examples, including those used most often by proponents of creatio ex nihilo, Milton argues that the Bible nowhere justifies this idea. Scripture tends, he claims, to imply the contrary, namely that all things were not made out of nothing. So supplementing this exegetical investigation, Milton adopts a rational approach, claiming that one who says that to create is to bring forth from nothing is also, as the dialectici say, urging a premise unsupported. He then provides his own arguments. Since no agent can act outside of itself unless there exists something to be acted upon, which doubtless is matter, it seems that God could not have created the world out of nothing. It is impossible to perform any action, including creation, if there is nothing upon which that action can be acted. Not wanting to seem as though he's qualifying God's abilities, Milton adds the caveat. He means could not, not from any lack of power or omnipotence, but because there had to be something already in existence which, by being acted upon, might receive the almighty force of its efficacy. So it's not as though God cannot do anything. Uh, he can, cannot do anything. He does not lack any power or omnipotence. But, God's force and but for God's force and efficacy to work, there must, in the strongest sense of the term, be something there to receive it. There exist logically and metaphysically necessary conditions that must be in place before God can exercise his power. In any change, potentiality must be actualized in a patient by an agent. For Milton, the patient of divine creation is matter. 
But Milton is, of course, not reverting back to the Platonic position laid out in the Timaeus and then progressively refined and reworked in such thinkers as Plotinus and the Hellenic Jewish philosopher Philo. In this view, God, or a first principle, creates by forming an eternally existing, unoriginated matter. Matter was there, and God creates by acting into that unformed matter, which is as close to, which is as close to nothing as can be, but is still something. In De Doctrina, Milton rejects the view that matter existed from eternity. But he also rejects the view that God creates ex nihilo. Uh, so Milton argues instead, as all of you know, uh, that all things come out of God, uh, ex Deo. An idea, he claims, is sanctioned by no less an authority as St. As, as Paul, who in Romans 11.36 writes, out of him and through him and into him are all things. So Milton claims that, the, that God is the efficient, formal, final, and, as Steve knows very well, material cause of creation. The material cause is the matter that God makes from himself, the seed bank of every subsequent good, unarranged and disorganized substance that came from God, the fountainhead of all substance, who later arranged it and made it beautiful. The full picture, then, is something like this. At some time, matter originated from God, and this matter is that upon which God acts when God creates the world, organizing and beautifying matter by extending or giving out his goodness and virtue and power into that matter. Milton clarifies by appealing to another idea he thinks should be altogether exploded. I've got to love the violence built in so language. Um, annihilation. Right? So since God did not produce all things out of nothing but out of himself, and since all things are not only from God but out of God, and since no mention whatsoever is made in scripture of this annihilation, this means that no created thing can perish into nothing. So the categories of supernatural change inherited by Milton involve the movement from nothing to something or from something to nothing. When God created, he created out of nothing. Not out of nothing, says Milton, that's an impossibility, but rather out of his own matter. So, so in making this argument, Milton attempts to destroy the idea of creatio ex nihilo, replacing it with an updated version of ex nihilo nihil fit. Nothing comes from nothing. Now this is a remarkable thing to do uh, in, the mid to late, in mid to late 17th century Europe. As Dimitri Levitin's new doorstopper of a book, it's like 950 pages, uh, The Kingdom of Darkness uh, argues, the principle of creation ex nihilo was seen as the centerpiece of Christian thinking, understood as distinct from the sort of thinking that any and all pagans, Greeks, Romans, Chaldeans, Egyptians, Indians, Chinese, Japanese, and so on, were capable of producing. Creation ex nihilo is not, it was widely believed in this moment, available through reason. It is available only through revelation. So part of an emerging consensus about the limits of the pagan mind, the human mind without Christian revelation, that was crystallized by Fossius's De Theologia Gentili in 1641, and then deepened by Pierre Gassendi's Syntagma in 1658, and reworked by dozens of scholars, including some of Milton's English contemporaries, this privileging of creation ex nihilo framed this idea as that which distinguished Christian thought from non-Christian thought. So what early modern philologists and a variety of other thinkers saw as the consistency of ideas in the various philosophical systems they were discovering from the annals of the past and from various global cultures was due, they thought, to the starting point of these systems. That everything, the foundational sense, that everything must come from something else, that nothing comes from nothing. And if that's your starting place, there's only so much you can do, according to this um, line of thinking. So Milton had read the work of many major players in this emerging consensus. And in De Doctrina, he rejected precisely the idea that this consensus upheld as central to Christian thought. Why? Um, so let us return to Milton's vicious dismissal of creatio ex nihilo. Most moderns contend that everything emerged out of nothing. It is these nameless modernity who are the subject of Milton's attack. Who are they? I think that we are in a position to say that they are, first and foremost, those who understand creation from nothing in a strong sense. Those who hold that divine creation does not presuppose matter. Now, the most obvious source for this idea is Thomas Aquinas who advances a rigorous sense of creation ex nihilo across his corpus, rejecting the formulations of his immediate predecessors, Bonaventure and Albert the Great, both of whom claimed that creation ex nihilo was an article of faith, not something for which one could argue philosophically. In his early commentary on the sentences, Aquinas defines creation as the production, quote, of a thing into being according to its entire substance. 
totem suum substantium. Whereas generation presupposes matter, in creation, the causality of the creator extends to the creature in its totality. For Aquinas, nothing that is not the creator pre-exists created things. This means that, as Louis Xavier Lopez Carrier puts it, in creation, there is no material cause for Aquinas. So note how Aquinas' view differs from that of the church fathers, who tend, along with Irenaeus and Augustine, to argue that God first creates matter and then uses that matter to create everything else. Whereas these antiqui are close to the view that Milton propounds, such moderni as Aquinas have, in Milton's view, taken a long turn. Across his career, Aquinas provides a number of such arguments in ways that shore up this view. As he notes in De Patentia, when God creates, quote, he produces the whole subsisting being with nothing presupposed. Or, as he puts it in the Summa, divine creation does not presuppose matter, but instead God brings things into being from nothing. This view had a long afterlife. So consider just one example, the lapidary phrasing in the 16th century Coimbran commentary, God produces from nothing, nature from potential being, God by creating, nature by generating. In the broad scholastic tradition, creation from nothing is what distinguishes divine activity from natural activity. And creation ex nihilo is something for which one can argue in a rigorously philosophical way. Now, as R. E. Hauser has decisively, I think, proven, Aquinas' understanding of creation borrows heavily from the arguments and the conceptual frameworks developed by Ibn Sina, a philosopher who thought that one of the things metaphysics must do is, quote, explain the transition from nothing to something, from non being to being. So scholars now think that much of Ibn Sina's metaphysics is motivated by an insight into the idea that creation from nothing is a radically new form, both of causation and of change, one that could not be accommodated within the Aristotelian framework. So this involves a strong distinction, as I'm sure many of you know, between the necessary existent, something that exists through itself, and all other things, which exist not necessarily, but contingently. All things that exist contingently have their existence through the necessary existent. The existence of contingent things is really boring. So earlier thinkers had made the distinction between God and the world in other ways. Augustine, for example, makes the distinction in terms of the eternal and the temporal. John Colopinus makes the distinction in terms of the infinite and the finite. Ibn Sina sharpens this distinction by claiming that at its core, what distinguishes God from the world is the, the difference between necessary existence and contingent existence. Now, in so doing, Ibn Sina not only invents the concept of contingency, this is a long-established chestnut in conceptual history, but in the estimation of Charles Kahn, brings the concept of existence itself into being. Here's Kahn. My general view of the historical development is that existence in the modern sense becomes a central concept in philosophy only in the period when Greek ontology is radically revised in the light of the metaphysics of creation. That is to say, under the influence of biblical religion. As far as I can see, this development did not take place with Augustine or with the Greek church fathers who remained under the sway of classical ontology. The new metaphysics seems to have taken shape in Islamic philosophy in the form of a radical distinction between necessary and contingent existence, between the existence of God on the one hand and that of the created world on the other. And, I don't know, Khan has spent, you know, decades thinking about this, so that we can, you know, at least grant him that this is a serious thing to say. But. So, existence as a concept reorients the metaphysical discussion of what is uh, around the difference between non-being and being. In Ibn Sina's hands, necessity and contingency perform work that Aristotle's categories of potentiality and actuality do not, right? So, Fazlur Rahman puts it this way, Contingency is not the same as potentiality, for whereas the latter is destroyed by actual existence, the former continues simultaneously with existence. So in other words, when the potential becomes actual, it no longer remains potential, but when the contingent actually exists, it still remains contingent. So in an Aristotelian framework, change takes place with the actualization of a given potentiality, an activity underwritten by matter. Ibn Sina's view eliminates this condition, for the act of creation is no longer from potentiality to actuality, but rather from the necessary existence to possible or contingent existence. As Ibn Sina puts it in the metaphysics of his Al-Shifa, 
the necessary existence intellection of the existence is their very existence proceeding from him. Even more radically, in the Isharat, or remarks and admonitions, Ibn Sina says of this creation, quote, immediate creation, al-ibda, is a thing's giving existence to another that depends on nothing other than it, without the mediation of matter, instrument, or time. So there are no forms of mediation in divine creation, which takes place atemporally, without matter, and without any instrument between creature and between creator and creature. Now it's easy to see how Milton would take issue with this way of understanding creation. Right? After all, Milton insists on the mediation of matter and time in the act of creation. In Book 7 of Paradise Lost, he also includes the mediation of an instrument, right? The sun striding out into chaos with his compass, you know, firmly uh, uh, in hand. So Milton wants a creation that is temporally, material, materially, and even perhaps instrumentally mediated. Um, now, in addition to that, it's also easy to see how Aquinas adopted certain features of Avicenna's understanding of creation. Most importantly, for our purposes, the idea that creation is an activity without a material cause without the mediation of matter. So in question 44, article two of the summum, Aquinas offers a four-step history of metaphysics in order to develop the claim that God is the, uh, the, the cause of creatures in every sense of the term. And that is efficient, formal, and final. And he's even the cause of matter, though he's not the material cause. So the first, and this, this is a kind of four-step history, I'm gonna go through it really quickly. The first step sort is pre-Socratic philosophers who thought that only sensible bodies the second sort of pre-Socratic philosophers considered matter to be uncreated, but assigned causes to accidental changes. The great achievement of the third stage of philosophy was to grasp a distinction between matter, still thought to be uncreated, and substantial form. So Plato and Aristotle are, of course, here the stars of the show. But the problem, says Aquinas, with each of these steps in the history of metaphysics remains the same. Quote, each of these opinions writes Aquinas, considered being under some particular aspect, either this, either as this, or as such, and so assigned particular efficient causes to things. And then enters the hero of Aquinas' story, uh, an unnamed hero much like the unnamed Moderni in uh, Milton's De Doctrina. Then others, aloquy, there were, who arose to the consideration of being as being, and who assigned a cause to things, not as these or as such, but as beings. So it's from this, these, uh, from, from this unnamed aliquy that Aquinas takes his lead. And as Hauser, I think, has definitively shown by tracing Aquinas' history of philosophy back to De Potentia and forward to other later works, the aliquy in question is undoubtedly Avicenna. The thinker who, by grasping the difference between the necessary existent and all other things that exist contingently because of it, had philosophically proven that everything that exists is divinely created. So we have then, in Ibn Sina's work, a reframing of the relationship between God and the world that provides a new conceptual coherence for the idea of creatio ex nihilo. A coherence, the power of which was understood and discussed by Aquinas in what might be the first of many accounts of creation ex nihilo provided by the European moderni attacked by Milton in his account of creation in De Doctrina. Okay, so to clarify, so far I've made two interlocking arguments. First, the differentia distinguishing the ex nihilo creation of the antiqui from that of Milton's moderni is the rigor with which the nihilo is thought. The moderni exclude the mediation of matter from their account of creation. Now, second, Aquinas is, to my knowledge, the first, and I might be wrong, please correct me, uh, the first major European moderni to make this argument. And he inherits it from a thinker whose ideas about creation he often puts on an equal plane with Genesis 1.1, Avicenna, the philosopher whose rigorously unmediated idea of creation makes him, I think, the father of Milton's moderni. So allow me to conclude this talk by making a third argument. It is obvious and uncontentious that Milton's account of the moderni could draw on Aquinas, who could have presented Milton with a mediated version of Avicenna's ideas about creation. In closing, I would like to suggest that Milton could very easily have gone to the source, that Milton had opportunity and reason to consult the works of Avicenna. So thanks to Doug Hassa, Nancy Sarizi, and other scholars, we have a robust picture of the influence of Avicenna's ideas on medicine, psychology, physics, metaphysics, and other disciplines in the Middle Ages and in early modern Italy. 
When Hauser won the Aquinas Medal in 2019, his lecture was entitled Aquinas the Avicenna. This takes our knowledge of medieval Avicennism further than before, but it's building on a really strong foundation stretching back to Etienne Gilson and beyond. Um, but we do not, so far as I know, yet have an account of Avicenna's influence in early modern Northern Europe. I've begun researching this between them by looking for traces of Avicenna's presence in 17th century England. The traditional story was that Avicenna exerted a major influence on various medieval Aristotelianisms, but that by the 17th century, his influence existed only in a mediated way, more or less forgotten. But in his mammoth success and suppression, Doug Hassa, 2016, Harvard University Press, Hassa has shown that, in fact, the high watermark of Avicenna's influence was in the Renaissance. Between 1485 and 1674, just chosen arbitrarily, well, not so, the year Milton died, uh, almost 80 editions of disparate Latin translations of Avicenna's works were printed in subsidies as Lyon, Amsterdam, Venice, Groningen, Frankfurt, and other continental hubs. Avicenna was not translated into English, and his works were not printed in Latin editions by English presses. A search of early English books online thus suggests that Avicenna had only a minimal, unmediated presence uh, in early modern English intellectual life. A quote here and there, mainly in medicine. But my research into institutional and private libraries tells a very different story. I found several hundred copies of Avicenna's works in Latin translation that probably lined uh, English library shelves. So this research is still ongoing. I have about 300 things that I think were probably on shelves, uh, but you know, one has to check provenance and you know all that. Um, so I've now determined that uh, by, by provenance, uh, that of, of, I've now uh, you know determined at least 100 books uh, of Avicenna's uh, writing that were in England uh, uh, well during 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 Milton's lifetime, and there are probably many more. So the traditional story is true, right? Many of Avicenna's ideas reached 17th century English thinkers in diffuse and mediated ways. But it's also true that Avicenna's works were directly available to many English writers. And in fact, the library of Milton's friend, Nathan Paget, the library that we know Milton consulted at various times in his life, contained a copy of Avicenna's opera and a number of other of Avicenna's works. So the Cambridge li libraries that Milton haunted for years also housed various copies of Avicenna's works. Thanks to the work of Nabil Matar, Muhammad Sid Amid, Alexander Bevel Aqua, and others, we know that 17th century English scholars maintained a lively interest in Arabic learning, an interest Milton shared. While working as the Secretary for Foreign Tongues, Milton is at least I don't know, tangential to the 1649 publication of Ross's English translation of the Quran. And in Prelusion 7, he commends Islamic powers for enlarging their empires as much by the study of liberal culture as by force of arms. You know, if only England could do that too. Uh, a strategy he hopes England will adopt. So Milton was interested in Arabic learning, um, and Avicenna's works were available to him. I'm still working out the details of Avicenna's influence on Milton. In a paper forthcoming in Representations, I argue that Milton owed his sense of mat that matter is active uh, to a line of thought stretching back through Avicebron to Avicenna. In his matter theory, I think Milton reworks one of Avicenna's ideas, positively. By contrast, in today's lecture, I have suggested that Milton argues against Avicenna's innovative understanding Creation. To put the argument baldly and in a form that I would like to substantiate more fully as I continue this work, Milton's attack on the Moderni and their framing of creation ex nihilo is informed by his sense that the conceptual architecture of late medieval scholasticism is indebted to Avicenna. The extent to which, and I'm finishing now, the extent to which Milton read Avicenna in Latin translation is a line of research I aim to pursue in the coming years. But I hope that I have at least revealed how such direct reading was possible. Let me finish by suggesting that my hypothesis of Milton's awareness of the Islamic roots of the sort of ex nihilo argument grounded in arguments about existence does shed light on why he argues so vociferously against the principle at the heart of what Levitin sees as an emerging consensus about what makes Christian thought unique. Adopting a Miltonic perspective, we might say that by framing their arguments against pagan rationality, such philologists as Fossius, and philosophers as Gassendi ignored what Christian thinking shares with other monotheistic traditions. Right? It's perhaps this insight that stands behind Milton's rejection of creatio ex nihilo. If a truly robust account of ex nihilo creation first takes shape in Islamic thought, then such a principle cannot occupy the heart of a truly Christian doctrine. 
in a move reminiscent of how humanists use the ideal of reading ad fontes to bypass Arabic middlemen and get back to an unmediated relation to Greek thought, Milton goes back to a beginning before Ex Nihilo, a beginning encoded in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin word use, in scripture, and most radically in human reason itself. So if there is a story to tell about Milton's Avicenna, then it is not only a story of connections made across disparate traditions, it's also a story of what Zoltan Biedermann calls disconnection, a story in which, in which contact across traditions is raised only to be refused. Thank you. Sanford Budick, uh, professor of English at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem since 1984. Before his tenure at the Hebrew University, he was professor of English at Cornell University. Uh, at the Hebrew University, he founded the Center for Literary Studies and was its director from 1982 to 2002. Sandy has twice won the James Holly Hanford Award for the year's best book on Milton, once in 1985 for The Dividing Muse. Images of Sacred Disjunction in Milton's Poetry, published by Yale University Press, and again in 2010 with Kant and Milton, published by Harvard University Press. His other books include Dryden and the Abyss of Light, a study of Religio Laisi, and The Hind and the Panther, Poetry of Civilization, Mythopoeic Displacement in the Verse of Milton, Dryden, Pope, and Johnson, as well as The Western Theory of Tradition, Terms and Paradigms of the Cultural Sublime. Each of these was published by Yale University Press. His most recent book, published in 2021, is entitled Hazarding All, Shakespeare and the Drama of Consciousness, published by Edinburgh University Press. Sandy has also edited several books, including one with Jeffrey H. Hartman entitled Midrash and Literature. He has also worked closely with Wolfgang Eisner, including in two co-edited books, Languages of the Unsayable, the Play of Negativity in Literature and Literary Theory, and The Translatability of Cultures, Figurations of the Space Between. Sandy is the recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship in 1986-87, and a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship in 2002-03. Steve met Sandy when speaking at Sandy's own retirement conference in Jerusalem in 2011, and they have been fast friends ever since. His talk today is entitled Milton and Kant on Coexistent Being and the Reciprocal Forces of First Matter. Thank you, Sam. title really says it all. I don't really have to give the lecture. Um, <laughs> Milton and Kant on coexistent being and the reciprocal forces of first matter. My aim here is to explain and demonstrate in Miltonic poetics that, that with the exception of very remarks of Immanuel Kant has thus far eluded description. I will turn to Kant's illuminations after uh, first turning directly to Milton's poetry. This is the only time where I'll, I'll give you a part of my text, but it's, uh, it's so naughty I thought it'd be best for you to be able to read it with me. In Paradise Lost, the work of this poetics is the transformation of the poet's and the reader's consciousness of self into a direct participation in the reciprocal forces of, quote, first matter. We will see that the end product of this participation is experience of coexistent being. Milton affects this transformation by recognizing and entering into the reciprocal forces within the most basic unit of existence in the world of the poem, the quote, animist materialism of first matter that Stephen Fallon has indispensably identified throughout the poem. To Fallon's key insight, we should add that in Paradise Lost, that animated first matter as Milton describes, is foundationally identified with, quote, light ethereal 
first of things. That light, as Raphael puts it, that is constituted by the communicating community of its reciprocal forces. Those reciprocal forces, is that the end of it? I think so. No. Um, I don't know if we can get up between, between slides so, to eliminate the distraction, okay? Those reciprocal forces within light are light and darkness, where this darkness is something totally different from a satanic, obliterating, or possessing kind. In the Dead Doctrina Christiana, Milton insisted on the God-bestowed force of created darkness. And here the uh, convergence with, with Tim's paper. Milton and the Dr. De, De Doctrino, quote, that this darkness was far from being a mere negation is clear from Isaiah, in quotes, I am Jehovah, I form the light and create darkness, end quote. Indeed, one of the poem's chief moral and creative ambitions is to find the way to poetic emulation of God's intentionality at the moment, quote, he first brought light out of darkness, light exhaling first from darkness. Milton carefully reproduces Genesis' two-stage account of the creation of light out of darkness, in which the addendum of the second stage is the intentionality of the constitutive forces of light and darkness to produce the beneficent good, quote, of light celestial in the heavenly bodies. This intentionality for the good of all being is the, quote, answering great idea that fully creates the purpose of reciprocity within, quote, celestial light. Milton dramatically locates God's intentionality of light and darkness in the heavens holy of holies at the gates, quote, the gates of light and morn for all creation. There, in a, quote, a cave, beneath the mount of God, light and darkness, quote, in perpetual round, dislodged by turns, which makes through heaven grateful vicissitude, end quote. Commentators have surely been correct in hearing something like an allusion within these verses to a passage in the third book of the Fairy Queen. In that passage of Spencer, we hear of the, quote, baleful night that by succession made perpetual, there in a strong rocky cave underneath the Mount of Venus, this darkness is rendered ineffectual, powerless, like the, quote, wild boar that wounded Adonis and that is forever imprisoned. Yet the point of Milton's allusion is made by the pains he takes to distinguish sharply his idea of a darkness that is, so, quote, obsequious, which means in, in, in Milton's English, obsequious means dutiful, serviceable, distinguishes that kind of darkness from Spencer's variety of threatening imprisoned forces of darkness in that mount. So too, in contrast to Spencer's account of Venus's possessive, even imprisoning and exploitative as well as sterile eros, we will soon see that Milton's, quote, male and female light, end quote, are reciprocal, in quotation marks, and procreative, creative of a, quote, communicating community. This reciprocity is enabled by darkness of a special kind. I propose that the emergence of this purposive higher order darkness that is reciprocal with the emergence of the purposive higher order celestial light is one of the poem's most important and most challenging poetic transformations. In Paradise Lost, this darkness is systematically, purposively produced as a, form, as a force of negativity in the experience of the sublime. Correlatively, that experience of the sublime is the result of encountering the effectively endless, quote, perpetual progression of this reciprocal light and darkness, dislodging by turns. Thus, the purposive production of higher order darkness as a force of negativity, obsequiously, dutifully, serviceably, creates the condition of self-effacement that opens the way to experience of the purposive higher order celestial light. That light radiates community and coexistent being. I will soon say a further word about the sublime and this productive negativity of darkness. In Paradise Lost, entering into the reciprocity of coexistence by deploying, by expressing the reciprocal forces of light and darkness aims to fulfill Milton's early hope in, of education, quote, to repair the ruins of our first parents 
by regaining to know God aright, end quote. As we have begun to see, expression, expression of this kind is not mere representation, but rather the onward animated communication of those higher order reciprocal forces of light and darkness. Milton embedded a template of this instruction for expressing celestial or holy light in Raphael's proposition concerning the, quote, reciprocal constitution of that light in Book 8. Raphael there unfolds this proposition in response to Adam's question, repeating Eve's question, about so much of the light of the universe that is apparently, quote, useless when sleep hath, sh hath shut all eyes. Raphael explains, explains this in the form of hypothesis that must itself be explained. We will see later that these are the specific verses of Paradise Lost on which Kant repeatedly focuses, focusing as well on the form of its hypothesis. This is Raphael in Book 8. What if that light, sent from Earth through the wide transpicuous air to the celestial moon be as a star, enlightening her by day as she by night this Earth, reciprocal, if land be there, fields and inhabitants, her spots thou seest as clouds, and clouds may rain, and rain produce fruits in her softened soil for some to eat allotted there, and other suns, perhaps, will, with their attendant moons thou wilt describe, communicating male and female light, which two great sexes animate the world, stored in each orb, perhaps, with some that live. In fact, Raphael has prepared his template of the, of, the, of the reciprocal of light in the following prior hypothesis about the reciprocal moving forces of light and darkness within the animated matter of the heavens themselves. What if the sun and the forces of light, he offers, are moved contrary with thwart obliquities in a nocturnal and dire, diurnal rom, a wheel of day and night, so that earth, industrious of herself, fetch day traveling east, and with her part averse from the sun's beam, meet night, her other part still luminous by his ray. The phrase is moved contra contrary with thwart obliquities, nocturnal and diurnal rom, and wheel of, of day and night have often come in for perplexed commentary. Even strange suggest strained suggestions that Milton goes to the trouble of elaborating these ideas only in order to remove them from speculation. Milton certainly frames all of the poem's assertions concerning the nature of material creation with provisos and caveats that remind us of the limitations of human understanding. Yet in Paradise Lost, this mere hypothesizing, the back and forth of our weighing those matters, itself expresses something solidly real in the forces of reality itself, namely a back and forth movement of forces in the mind that are themselves the effect of the reciprocal back and forth purposive forces of light and darkness within the, quote, first matter that is light ethereal. Inciting these ideas, Raphael has prepared for the arch hypothesis and our experience of the reciprocal forces of male and female light that animate the world. The reciprocal radiation of that light is not a simultaneous mirror shining. Rather, it is a successive or serial communication of, quote, the sun's beam that forms a chain of bestowals of that light. This serialism anticipates the subsequent chain of clouds, rain, soil, fruit, and, quote, some to eat. We are gradually given to understand that the determinant of this ongoing reciprocity is a founding idea. God's, quote, great idea of the purpose of chain. The beneficiary entities within the chain abide by and within the purpose of design of this reciprocity. Sociologists have recently given a name to this kind of reciprocation, calling it serial reciprocity. Rather than making uh, payment, re excuse me, rather than making repayment to the benefactor agency, reciprocation of an equivalent benefaction is here necessitated in the form of paying onward to another beneficiary, person or thing. That other beneficiary is then moved by the necessity of, of reciprocally, serially forwarding an equivalent benefaction to someone else, to someone or something else. In recent times, 
the idea of a chain of such a serial reciprocity has popularly been called paying it forward. This idea can seem to be a modern uh, discovery, but its basic structure goes back at least to in, in Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics and to ideas of linked blessing, blessings always paid forward. In the Hebrew Bible, such are God's blessings to Israel continued archetypically in the chain of blessing by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the New Testament, such are the linked blessings of Father and Son onward to all of humanity. In Paradise Laws, uh, Milton locates and sustains the event of this serial reciprocity within a limitless network of divine and, and human reciprocities. Preeminent and central among these representations of a reciprocal expression of life is a, spe is a specific scriptural model and warrant that Milton invokes throughout the poem. This is the, ex the quote, expression of the divine word and divine brightness that creates holy life as first matter in the epistle to the Hebrews, Paul's epistle to the Hebrews uh, in, in chapter one, verse three. Excuse me. <clears throat> Milton repeatedly makes clear his understanding that this verse lays out the divine intention of the forces that constitute holy life. Here is the verse in the King James Version. Uh, uh, where the Greek noun character expression is rendered in adjectival form. The brightness of his glory and the express image of his person upholding all things by the word of his power when he had, him, had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. From this verse Milton again and again invokes God's intentionality of reciprocities of both word and light both together, answering the good of his great idea. Throughout the poem, throughout Paradise Lost, the participle answering, quote answering, that we meet within the phrase answering his great idea is extended to repeated usage as a verb and noun of the answer. By the end of the poem, we understand, even experience, how emulating the answering act of creating first matter that, quote, first brought forth light out of darkness, end quote, has now been performed in the realm of the human. Milton's refer references to the scene of light's creation, quote, of heaven, born, heaven first born, undoubtedly refl uh, reflect his awareness that Hebrews 1.3 is itself in intensely close reciprocity with the answering relation of light creating word to light creating word in Genesis 1.3. So that Hebrews 1.3 of the New Testament itself answers Genesis 1.3 of the Hebrew Bible. From among, and by the way, the, the, the verse, the, the, the crucial verse in, in Paradise Lost where, where Milton talks about it providing his own expression of this light is book three, verse three, <laughs> and which comes then to 33, which then is the three years of Christ at the crucifixion. Something going on there, uh, uh, clearly, that uh, he's playing with. Um, okay. From among Milton's multiple invocations of Hebrews 3, I, uh, I hear instance uh, Raphael's invocation and folding of this verse in book 6. He, the Father, said, and on his, uh, uh, and on his Son, with the raised erect, shone full. He, all his Father, full expressed in, uh, ineffably into his face received, and thus the filial Godhead answering spake, Power thy giving, I assume, and gladly or shall resign, when in the end thou shalt be all in all, and I in thee forever, and in me all whom thou lovest. In this serial reciprocity, we deployed by detailed, direct allusion from Hebrews 1.3, Milton finds the poetic model, as well as great confirmation for his own expression at Book 3, verse 3, of an answering reciprocity of moving forces in that light which he communicates onward to the reader in the words of his poetry. This is to say that in the expression of this verse, Milton sees that the word of the Father is serially reciprocal with the word of the Son, whom God has just named the saving Messiah, in, in Milton, and, and that the light of the Father is serially reciprocal with the light of the Son that will save all of humanity. These reciprocities express light, bring it into sustained existence as serially 
coexistent being, all passed on direct, directly to the reader. <clears throat> in Milton's interpretive hands, the expression of the philology, indeed of the philo logos within Hebrews 1.3, is thus employed to achieve extraordinary heights of poetic expression, unblamed, precisely as Milton prayed to, quote, express it in the opening of book three. In each of his citations of Hebrew 1, 3, Hebrews 1.3, he makes explicit the act of expression within the reciprocal pattern of the Father's word, said, spoken, that shines light on the Son, while reciprocally and in serial potentiality, the Son's word, spoken, answering, shines forth, received, resplendent light. No. Something has dropped out. That's okay. Um, this uh, just another quotation from from Milton using the, the uh, Hebrews one one three. So spake the Father, and unfolding bright toward the right hand his glory on the sun blazed forth and and uh, unclouded deity. He full resplendent, resplendent. Uh, all his father manifest, expressed, and thus divinely answered mild. Milton's unfolding of this serial reciprocity of word and light and of bringing light out of darkness, all in reciprocal oscillation, is all encompassing. In Paradise Lost, the disclosure of reciprocal light out of darkness by the reciprocal word takes place not only in instances where Milton explicitly employs the terminology of reciprocal expression, but in the dozens of similes, the monumental Miltonic similes, that are each structured on a reciprocal recounting of post-lapsarian and pre-lapsarian conditions, just so, and indeed, uh, on an epic scale for Paradise Lost as a whole, never far from the reader's conscious or unconscious experience of the framing, framing serial reciprocity of Christianity and Judaism, and of Judeo-Christian narrative with the pa pagan epic form that intend, it intends to absorb within the experience of a humanity that is moving toward redemption. For the poet and reader of this poem, these are expressions of providential reciprocity, not of one-sided supersessionism. Thus far with Milton's answering, God's answering idea of reciprocal light and darkness, I turn now to Kant's answering illuminations of Milton's answering, which will be much shorter. Over the course of two decades, Kant systematically advanced towards, uh, toward these uh, illuminations in a series of contemplations of Milton's poetry that were woven into his then current philosophical preoccupations. These reflections are repeatedly directed at Ra Raphael's verse verses about the reciprocal forces of life. The particular re realizations that here concern us um, culminated in laborious revisions in his own handwriting This is Alcant's manuscript. Um, uh, his revisions of in his own hand, handwriting of two pages of the manuscript known uh, as the Opus Postumum. With meticulous care, Kant shaped these two pages into one highly integrated page that I will refer to as Zeta 40 prime. Commentators have not noted that in the Opus Postumum, Kant attached special importance to this boundary marking of a given manuscript sheet or page. Vittorio Mathieu explained that Kant's method of composition in the Opus Postumum was built on the enclosed or cell-like units of each sheet or page. And here I quote, translate from uh, Vittorio Mathieu, quote, he says, as a cell in an organism always represents the entire body, every sheet or page of the Opus Postumum represents, as it were, the entire line of thought and each under a special aspect. Consequently, every page becomes a mirror of the whole work. In fact, in the, in the, in the case of Zeta 40 Prime, Kant has marked the boundaries, or opening and closing, of his extensively revised page by repeating his paraphrase from the verses of Raphael's uh, extended hypothesis uh, at Paradise Laws 150-52, that is a quote of male and 
female light stored in each orb, perhaps, end quote. Seen within the exposition of ether light that Kant elaborates in the Opus Postumum, the reciprocities on, on Zeta 40 prime between Kant's paradigm of experience and the verses of Raphael that Kant explicitly invokes there serve indeed as a cellular picture of the whole of the Opus Postumum. Although I previously devoted a monograph to Kant's interest in Milton's poetry, I then failed to glimpse the coherence of Milton's uh, Miltonic, of Kant's Miltonic insights on this page. I do not much blame myself for this large oversight. Not only did no other commentator take note of them, but as I have learned with considerable struggle, following Kant's extended engagement with Milton on that manuscript page requires sustained delving through layer upon compressed layer of collocated meanings. The pr this premier moment of Kant's insight concerning Miltonic light emerged in the Apus Postum when he was there attempting nothing less than an epistemological shift. Within the Apus Postum, Postum, it occurred in his final transcendental deduction, the so-called ether deduction, a first matter, and the experience of coexistent being, the basis of which he had begun to formulate in chapter two of the Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Science, and in the third analogy of experience of the critique of pure reason. Especially fascinating and particularly relevant to Kant's interest in, in Raphael's what if verses are Kant's formulations of the purposive reciprocal moving forces of ether light as an hypoth quote, hypothesis. He, re he returns to this again and again. Quote, do I have this? this I don't think so. Um, Uh, this, is, this is Kant. Light, light material, Lichtstoffe, produces community in the moving forces of the matter of celestial bodies. This connection, he says, does not just establish the hypothesis, the hypothesa, of the experience of light material, but its actuality, which latter is contained in the concept of experience of the unity of moving forces. Although Kant's ideas of an ether light in any of their versions must now strike us as totally superannuated. There is no contradiction between our current views of physical reality and Kant's basic uh, propositions that the mind, too, is made of primary matter, and in addition that it is moved by forces of attraction and repulsion to, to trace such reciprocal forces in its own experience, not least in its experience of life. Of course, by the 19th century, theories of an ether were sharply displaced by theories of other kinds of primary matters. Yet even the most recent scientific developments in defining matter and energy describe a primary matter that is animated by reciprocal moving forces of repulsion and attraction, not least in photons of light. Without making even the smallest claim for the scientific prescience of Milton or Kant in these matters, I proceed on the conviction that the greatest poets and the greatest philosophers intuitively sustain a continuous applicability of their perceptions of reality to the realm of our lived experience of that same reality. This is not to deny that many of the representations of reality in Paradise Lost are at the same time symbolic. In Paradise Lost, the literal and the symbolic representations of reality do not exclude each other. In Raphael's verses, Kant observes that the condition of coexistent reciprocal experience of life in Day, quote, day and night, as in Milton's Wheel of Day and Night, light and darkness would be impossible were it not for the superadded directing force of the purposive, quote, preceding idea of an immaterial being. This is a basic uh, proposition throughout the office of costume. There has to be a preceding idea of it provided by an imperial, uh, immaterial being or by, by an imma immaterial proposition within the human, he says, immaterial principle in the mind. The Kant says, this is a pre primum movens of that first matter, which he says is, quote, also arousable as an active principle within the human mind. Almost certainly, for Kant, this arousal as an active principle in the human mind was it, and here I, I see the conversions between what I'm describing and what Rachel described, yes, of, uh, of uh, some kind of arousal which is already in the mind, but, uh, they, but it, it seems to me that what Milton is also doing is explaining to us how that arousal um, is caused. What arouses it? Yes, 
that concerns her. Um, so almost certainly for Kant, this arousal as an active principle in the human mind was at least in part a function of the experience of the sublime, that he added, which has also been mentioned here, both by Taylor and Kant, uh, by Rachel Effett, and it seems to me crucial for, for Milton always. Um, for Kant, this arousal of an active principle in the human mind was at least in part a function of the experience of the sublime that he analyzed in the, in the quote, analytic of the sublime with a critique of aesthetic judgment, the third critique, where the sublime of Milton's representation of light are of central interest to him, as they were in the whole of the German and English uh, exploration uh, of the, in the whole of the uh, German and English exploration of the sublime, beginning with Edmund Burke. Here I only recall that the heart of Kant's theory of the sublime is his proposition that encountering an endless, in, in Milton's word, you know, perpetual, uh, in encountering an, an endless, a perpetual progression, the mind experiences a suspension that is pure freedom, liberty, yes, um, promiscuous, I guess you could call it, uh, that is pure freedom as well as moral feeling, the experience of that which Hegel would rename as philosophical, quote, negativity. For Kant, in any case, fully as much as for what Milton invoked from Hebrews 1.3, a preceding or originating purpose of purposiveness or intentionality thus forms the onward serial intentionality in all being, whether as the provision of an immaterial, of an immaterial being or as the active principle of the human mind aroused to freedom and the directedness of moral feeling. On Zeite 40 Prime, Kant concretely, concretely implemented this insight concerning such a purposiveness or intentionality. He did this by inserting a, quote, actus of cognition, end quote, of the preceding idea. In this case, provided by Milton's citation of the angelic immaterial being who is, who is himself only citing the first of immaterial beings. Kant formulated the concept of the actus of cognition as follows, quote, we can know no objects, either within us or lying outside us, except insofar as we insert in ourselves the actus of cognition." End quote. This too is for Kant a, reciprocal, a, a, a serial reciprocity. For Kant and for what he sees in, Milton, in Milton's overall aims, even in Milton's intentionality within these, within these particular verses, insertion of an actus of cognition bestows the purposiveness of coexistent being on the intentionality of cognition itself. To sum up, here in their Kantian forms, Here in their Kantian forms, but in the order that, Mil that Milton's Raphael presents them, are the virtually exact equivalents of Raphael's terms that Kant inserts as his own actus of cognition, that is, of the multiplex, multiplex elements of the actus of cognition that he is re-recognizing or recognizing in those verses. The first of these principles. Um, to reach the goal of experience of the unity of coexistent being, the, quote, insertion of a hypothesis of what if that is actual as a preceding intention idea is ins indispensably required. This may be provided by an immaterial being and is arousable as an active principle or immaterial principle within the human mind. This preceding idea is of the purposive animated first matter that Kant refers to as ether light Ether light, like Milton's light ethereal, or that light, animates the world in reciprocal movement, so that the communicating ether light creates the reciprocal community of coexistent being. The identification in hypothesis of the animating forces of light with the moving forces of the two sexes that animate the world including the celestial bodies and their possible inhabitants, 
exhibits the generative purposiveness, the communicating of the preceding idea, even if only to unknown ends, as Rayfield says. For Kant, the actuality of a hypothesis for the human mind derives from its being the effect of the moving forces of light of animated first matter. Last, the human mind's hypothesis that is actual of the reciprocal <coughs> moving forces of ether light or light ethereal answers to God's preceding idea of the reciprocal forces of light and darkness. In the reverse wise, that's what Kant's term is the umgekehrt, tracing or expressing of these reciprocal perceptions, we fulfill the intentionality of communicating the preceding idea of purposive coexistent being. By following Milton in the elements and reciprocal forces of this reciprocity, Kant thus achieves his own striking beauty of philosophy, his own irradiated mind, in Milton's terms, communicating coexisting, coexistent being onward with Milton's poetry. Thank you.
they're, they're just as um, uplifting, but working on different tracks, or working together. Uh, so that studying mathematics doesn't just give you the right answer, but it gives you. Could you say what, what's uh, analogous between the experience of mathematics and the experience of poetry? Uh, well, I would say that um, uh, Milton's, um, I think he, he uses many of the same principles in all the same way. The ASD, you know, and the, the, he is trying in um, the, uh, to kind of work out proportions and politicize them. There are many facets of, of paradise laws that, in which he attempts to, uh, for instance, he's constantly talking about what's the difference between infinity and numberlessness and um, without number. <laughs> and how does one, these are, this is a problem of, about how to coming to terms with infinity, very period in which infinity is finally being mathematically uh, for the first time, through cal the invention of the calculus that Steve and I have talked about, uh, that uh, this is the first time that uh, there was an ability, we, we, at the beginning of the 17th century, we start with a kind of you know, fear of the infinite, but by the end of the century, making infinite uh, calculations is just commonplace through the calculus. I think Milton is uh, part of the process that helps that uh, infinity, in this one instance, to become, he is part, through his poetry, serves a function of turning the unusualness and scariness of infinity. And through his reading his poetry, helps us to bring it in to something that we can think about. Uh, and that his poetry, what he does with infinity, is comparable to what Newton does with his invention of It's one more way in your work of, of the approach to the supply. So yes, of approaching the supply. Yeah, that, that, that's, the, that's a key connection. I, I think that the, I think I think Ash is right. These are all amazingly uh, uh, interwoven, uh, not by design. Yeah. Um, I guess I want to ask. I want to ask Tim. Yes. This is this is new work. Um, there's a lot in there. And so I, and, and, and I think Sorry. we we have the uh, well no not. not We have this, this complicated relationship to have a sound, uh, in which we have a re rejection of, in terms of the uh, understanding of ex nihilo, but also influence of. You know, so uh, could you, I, I guess, say a bit more about how you're seeing at this point in your research the relation of the thought of, of Milton Avicenna mm -hmm. uh, on matter in the universe? Mm -hmm. On matter? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so this, this goes back to our, our Basically, my, my correspondence with Steve uh, has been all about like trying to understand Raphael's thing in the great chain of being, you know, kind of uh, you know, in things that live of life. Right. So if the whole thing is alive, how and what's the you know, and we we have diff very different solutions, you know, to the, the, the presence of life within matter. Right? But one of the ways I was trying to think about it is the distinction between you know, living and activity. Right. So matter seems to be active, but I'm not sure it's alive. I mean, we can we'll talk about that later. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, um, and the, I think the model for thinking about matter as active uh, is kind of coming from uh, Avicenna and Avicenna's uh, metaphysics, and then as it's like elaborated by Avicebron, and then you know there's uh, various books you know on kind of European you know uh, trajectories that this takes to a pursuit of Scotus, Bruno, you know, etc. Um, and it's not it's not always the case that you know, life and activity are so neatly. You know, parsed, but I think in, in, in Avicenna's account they are. And so, I've, so, so my sense is there's a kind of positive inheritance there, whether it's knowing or unknowing is interested. I think that the, I feel like the knowingness of the rejection of the ex nihilo of the modernity, um, as opposed to just the position, you know, to core, uh, is really interesting <laughs> when you kind of grasp the picture of, okay, it's coming out of, you know, this Islamic um, understanding of creation ex, ex nihilo, uh, which is, you know, Shaping much of the scholastic European you know, thinking about about creation, and so I've, 
But, so I guess like the, the short answer to your question is, well, Milton's doing without a set of what we do with everybody. You know, there's a little bit you like, a little bit you don't like, you know, and you kind of like, um, no one takes anything fully on board, right? Uh, I don't know, Kant appreciates something in Milton and presumably in Forrest, you know, uh, other things, or at least, you know, has like, takes issue with other things. I think it's, you know, so, so it's something like that. The answer would be like complicated, you know? Um, uh, and this is how, I don't know, various figures are taken up and responded to. Uh, attraction and I don't know, revulsion is too strong a word, but attraction and also like oh no, not that, I'm not that part, please. Yeah, repulsion. Yeah, repulsion. We've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, back. Yeah. This is great. I'm so glad I took the train out in Chicago for this. Um, so I'm a material culture scholar. So my entire Can't hear career. You. Sorry. Oh. Um, material culture, my entire career has been obsessed with putting Milton onto the grimy streets of London. And so um, I too was really drawn to what you describe at one point, thank you, um, as uh, you say in Milton, the literal and the symbolic, or indistinguishable, or uh, nothing comes from nothing. And so I'm circling back around to practical mathematics and Milton, because I wrote a book on this. Um, I'm kind of, yeah. Um, and so I was wondering, Euclidean geometry is one esoteric sub-branch, of course. And in the beginning of the 17th century, there is this explosion of practical mathematics. And yeah. so there's the invention of double entry bookkeeping yes. on estates. Yes. Um, there is the embrace of the surveyor or the non-university. And in fact, um, this kind of reflects in the academic development of mathematics as a field of study, yes. which is pretty late, right? Yes. And so Euclidean geometry is seen as um, circumscribed and for the fit though few, but Milton, of course, is the son of a debt collector. He is very in this world of mathematical knowledge as this expansive, promiscuous, alternate um, literacy yes. that yes. includes all of the mechanics. And yes. so in Of Education, Milton literally says, let's bring in, yes. right? Um, and so I'm wondering if maybe your thoughts on, um, and liberty, uh, so liberties of London were territories outside of the city wall that surveyors were brought yes. in to map um, during the encroachment of the crown, right? Um, from Westminster into London. And so um, is there a way of thinking through um, this kind of uh, mathematical literacy as distinct from and actually more accommodative of um, thinking promiscuously and reading promiscuously, especially when we're thinking about um, areopagitica's like the knowledge and survey of vice, right? So, um, in this way, we're not having to go into the eternal, but rather we're seeing the, um, the simultaneity of the literal and the symbolic, the material in the immaterial, right? That is a very multifaceted question. I feel my, my one um, start, uh, time to start to answer it is that when you mentioned, and perhaps I should have made it clear in my paper, that Milton, the new geometrical method is a re, is a is kind of a rejection of Euclid. Uh, they, uh, particularly as we speak by a Hobbes, who is often thought of as a nominalist, but he actually is very very interested in definitions. So he takes Euclid to task for saying, "What is what are these? Um, what is a line?" It doesn't make any sense. That, uh, that, what is a point of thing with no, you know, that is and isn't here? And what he wants to do is to reinvent Euclidean geometry. So by using definitions that can be generative, uh, that means that he's one of his, you know, and, and he does use one of the fundamental instruments of Euclidean geometry, which is the compass. And my reading of that scene with somebody, but it's when God, you know, when the sun comes forth with the compass, is a generative definition of a real thing. <laughs> it's a 
um, you, you generate the definition so that it is um, a, um, it's not circumspect, it's the very basis for everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have more to chat with you. <laughs> I, I did. Um, it's basically for Sandy, but um, in a way for everybody. Because um, Kant, it, it, the question is, is there a sense in which Kant is misunderstanding Milton? <laughs> because for Milton, creation is out of, God creates out of himself. But Kant is seeing, uh, uh, speaking of, you, your phrase is a purposive proceeding idea of an immaterial being. Or is it simply that we have a truth, but we don't have the language in our in Western metaphysics to talk about this? Because if God creates out of himself, then matter couldn't, couldn't be totally immaterial, could it? And, and if, so, so that's the, I guess that's the, I, I understand the Kant, Kantian point of view. I mean, Kant then would be one of these, uh, retro, retroactively, one of these modernity that, uh, that Finn was talking about. No, I, I don't think so. I think um, in a way he, he, he kind of anticipated your question. Uh, and uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the wrapper of one of the fascicles of this manuscript uh, that we have, he wrote, if there were not the spirit of God moving everything, there would be no transcendental philosophy. There would be no what? No transcendental philosophy. And, um, and I think that speaks to what you're talking about. I mean, he, he, he also goes back to that kind of, uh, of uh, point of derivation, um, just as Milton does. It, it seems to me that they're, they, uh, it's uncanny, the, the, the coinciding of, of Milton's schematism and, and, and Kant. Um, and he says this. It, uh, and you know, it was, it was against the whole uh, spirit of the times in Germany. Uh, Goethe and Schiller were just at that point emerging, and he said uh, the only two modern geniuses are Shakespeare and Milton, not, not, not the Germans. Uh, and, um, they, um, so he, he felt this this uh, tremendous uh, identity with, with Milton, I would say. We have time for a few more questions. <laughs> Tim, the reading of the, the, the moderns is amazing. And I wonder if you had something I was thinking about yesterday when we talked a little bit about this, but who then, how might this reconfigure who he thinks the ancients are? Like, because I'm, I was struck just reading, uh, rereading Steve's work in preparation for this, and Milton, it seems, actually does think of a early Hebrew philosophy that is also materialist. In ways that, that's so anyway, I was just yeah. thinking if, if that changes for you, how you think about that, that question. Yeah, um, that, who that, they, who that's, they are. that's really helpful, right? So that maybe the place to go if you want to get it right is all the way back as far as you can go, <laughs> yeah. um, philologically, right? Uh, to yeah. this ancient uh, Hebrew uh, stuff. And the, the church fathers then, well, they're not modernity, yeah. and they're not like, he doesn't, it, they presuppose matter, right? Thing, you know, is on the main, right? And so it's like that God makes matter and then God makes stuff from matter. So that's like, at least, it's not the same thing that Milton says, but it's like convertible yeah. into what Milton says in a way that, like, what, um, I don't know, Avicenna, Aquinas, others, you know, aren't, you know. Um, and so, uh, but maybe it's like, maybe the point is, the, I was searching for adjectives, you know, what is his relationship with these fathers? And maybe, the, maybe it's something like neutrality, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's not, that's not how I would put it, but they're not like totally up to lunch like the modernity, you know? Um, uh, but if you really want to know who's right, then we got to go all the way back, right? Um, or something like that. So that's a really helpful. Uh, so maybe it's not that the church fathers are the ancient. They're not the modernity, but they're also like not the, the ancients, you know? And so uh, a kind of helpful correlative would be to like uh, develop uh, an account of ancientness, uh, which he has a lot to say about, you know, ancient Christianity, but also, you know, yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah. Would the Vulcan be a modernity? If we're looking at the ancient, the, the, the ancient. I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. because, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. I'm just wondering because, yeah. uh, and, well, yeah. you know, better than I 
Yeah. But, but Jason Rosenblatt's work yeah. about um, yeah. that those materials and onus parts of the uh, Paris laws do, do come out of the, whatever Russ is referencing in the paint and he really thinks that he's like that when he um, begins to do his drawing with the search of apples mm. and it turns into a dual realist. <laughs> Once where it's clearly, I think, here about the scholastics, uh, and yes, once, once when it's about his contemporary English people, yeah. uh, or he's complaining about, and once where it's about like certain strands of like Reformation theologians that he disagrees with. So he, the word is kind of mobile. I don't think it's like a fixed thing, yeah. uh, but here I think it's uh, helpful. Can I can I ask a question of Sandy? Is, is that do I have time? Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I drew your blessing. Yeah. Okay. I, th thank you. Thank you so 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 much for that. And, I guess one thing I'm interested in, right, is like, okay, so you give this wonderful account of this reciprocality of like light and darkness and matter, and you know, in, in Milton's understanding of creation, and then you move there from there to this account of you know Kant uh, and how how the how, how the mind is working, right? And I, and I wonder, is it possible to stay within Paradise Lost and do this to do what you did for Kant with I don't know representations or um, uh, uh, descriptions of of mindedness, you know, in in Paradise Lost itself. That is, if we stay imminent to the text, what do we find out? Like, is, is this informing Milton's characters, let's say, in the same way that it's like informing content? Just a, the thing I'm thinking of, and this is, is this, this moment that I find so astonishing though, it feels like a, like a, a kind of like a prolepsis to like free and direct discourse or something. When like, God is like looking down at Satan flying, and then sees Satan's weary words, and Satan uncertain, you know, whether he's in, and so it's like God's inside Satan, you know, God is like looking at Satan, but looking through Satan and dealing with Satan, is, and this kind of like, I don't know, that kind of like, I don't know, I feel like that somehow speaks to us, something you might say. I yeah, no, 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 I have two chapters on that. No. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the point is, uh, for me, that this reciprocity is, is imminent, as you said, it has to be imminent in the poem, that's what I, I'm mm -hmm. trying to suggest. And if, uh, one of the great examples of this is uh, the, the, pr the presentation of, of uh, Christ as the greater man at the beginning, and then for me, for my reading of Paradise Lost, is the, is the greater woman who really is the reciprocal uh, receiver of that. And the whole poem really is framed by, by, by that. She, she, her, her incredible generosity. And so she's the one who saves humanity. Really. And, and, and Milton has built that into the, in the, the poem very strong. But throughout, in, in fact, in, in book three, you have a whole series of reciprocal odes. It opens, uh, and, and Milton marked book uh, three with an exact middle, uh, which has been noted, because I'm not the first uh, to see it. And it begins with the ode, and then with the reciprocal ode, with the beginning of the, in, in, the, in the center of the, in the second half of the, of the book. So the poem is, is saturated with, um, with it. And, and to me, I, I think that, that's what I was trying to suggest, that uh, uh, it seems to me, and, and Rachel answered, one has to find what he considers poetry to do. What's the work of poetry um, in all of this? Uh, and, uh, and, and I think he answers that. And that's what he means by expression. May I express the unblamed, right? That's what he's working on. Yeah. Okay, yes, there's uh, another the doorstep of a book, by the way. <laughs> oh, uh, The Kingdom of Darkness. Uh, Dimitri Levitin's book, The Kingdom of Darkness, um, uh, Bale, Newton, and the Emancipation of the European Mind from Philosophy. <laughs> what's, what's his name? Uh, Dimitri Levitin, E-L-E-V-I-T-I-N, yeah. Okay. Um, is that, well, what's that all say? But yeah, it's like, the, the footnotes are, it's worth the read just for the footnotes, which are hilarious. He's so mean. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, lunch is ready, but since since we're it's not every day that Professor Fallon retires, I think we can indulge ourselves in one more question, right? <laughs> so, go ahead. Thank you so much, if I may. I mean, I'm an interloper, um, so uh, but this was such a remarkable talk. I'll try to be really quick. But the first observation with regard to what Sandy said about the mathematics and and poetry, I think there's a question of the unity of the two. But it seemed to me that the answer was was given. And, Rachel's beautiful talk and proportionality. Um, and if proportionality is really the root for the mathematics and poetry uh, for the Greeks. Um, and that you know, related to the, the unity, the indifference of the apocalyptic and the geometric, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. So my, my, my question really concerns the extent um, of the influences on Milton. And I understand from, from Steve's work uh, that he's obviously in conversation with the Cambridge Platonists. Um, I wondered how much he was aware of Plato's psychology um, and the difference between you know, what the medievals would call intellectus and ratio, or nous and vianoia, you know, uh, speaking Erasmian Greek, or, um, you know, or in Augustine, sapientia and scientia. Those distinctions really just dominate you know, the West and, and, and the psychology of the West, and certainly the theology too, ranked in the Middle Ages. And, and so I wondered how aware he was of those um, or if that's somehow at the basis of that of your proposal for how to unite the prophetic and the mathematical or the apocalyptic and the geometric. And um, it seems like you have to go back to Plato to unite the things that in the modern world we've divided. Um, well, that's a really excellent question. I'm sure I really haven't um, answered, but I do think that... Um, sorry, I, 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 uh, always, I, 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 since I, I always... People tell me I talk too loud, so then I work for years and I don't talk loud enough. <laughs> so um, I, I'm not sure that I can on the spot come up with an answer to your excellent question, but what I would think, though, is that um, uh, that a lot of people consider uh, what Galileo a Platonist, so that possibly that the connection might be, you know, that his mathematics that, he, that the way he sees the world, that the, that the world is made, you know, we have to read it mathematically, um, would be the link um, between what you're saying about Plato and Milton, that via Galileo, and the link between the apocalypse and mathematics and, and, um, and Plato and Milton. Well, all these, you know, that, that what I would think would be Galileo's, the Galileo's view that the world that nature is written in the language of mathematics. And that if we don't learn how to read it and speak it, we're going to be wandering around in the labyrinth and just completely lost. Uh, but I think that um, uh, that's often been described as a Platonist view. <laughs> um, and that that might be the connection. But I, I have to have you ask me the question over again and give me a little more time to figure it out. But that, my, my first response would be to go to Galileo's view of the world as um, as inherently is written. It's a book that's written in mathematics, which might also suggest why mathematics can be a poetry, <laughs> uh, because uh, you know, it's just another way of describing the internal uh, structure of reality. <laughs> so it's just another language. Uh, it's a you know, it's translatable mathematics into poetry, poetry into mathematics. It, it's just like, um, you know, uh, there is a translation. Maybe something's lost in translation, but I think things are gained from translation <laughs> from the mathematical to the poetic and back again. I think you get the surplus, not a deficit. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, please join me in. Uh...